All right. So incrementing, type conversion, and random number generation. All right. So before we get there, we do have uh, something called a literal. It's when you literally type the value of a program of a, a variable in your program. So for example, when we had the um, the uh, area and or when we calculated the I think the perimeter of that circle in the first lab, we literally had the values of radius when we typed it in, right? So let me pull up this right here, public class lecture seven, public static void main string args. So again, int radius equals five. I typed, I literally typed in the value of radius, right? as opposed to me reading it in from the console or from some other value, right? If I read this in from the console, I won't know what the value of radius is until the program is run. However, since I, I typed in a literal right here, the value of radius is five, right? And if we visualize this, int radius equals five, right? This is memory over here, by the way, radius equals five. That's the value of radius. It's not read in from the console or from a file. I know what the value is before I even run it because I typed in a literal. Same thing goes for strings. String name equals Serena, right? That's a literal. I literally typed in the name Serena. If I go forward, name equals Serena. I didn't read that in from the console. I didn't read that in from a file. I typed in a literal. And that's what these are. These are literals. This is a string literal. This is an int literal, right? We do want to try to avoid literals as much as possible, okay? We want to avoid them as much as possible because you can make an error in a literal. Instead, to make our programs more responsive, we would read those values in from a file or from the console, right? It makes our programs more responsive to user input. We don't want it always to be Serena. We want the user to be able to type in a new name. They, we want them to type in their name or whatever it may be. So we want to avoid literals as much as possible. All right, so for math equations, right? I, I believe somebody mentioned, hey, this is how you would type it into a calculator. That is correct. If you have a TI-89 or TI, whatever all the different calculators are, um, you would type in a math equation similar to you would type it into a calculator. So if we have this equation, 4 divided by 5 plus 5x minus 4 divided by 3 minus 9, yada, yada, yada. It translates to this down here. We would need these parentheses in order to maintain the order of operations, right? So for example, in math, anything in parentheses gets uh, evaluated first. So these, this equation gets evaluated first. And within the parentheses, multiplication and division is a higher order of operation than subtraction and addition. This should be basic math, math for you. So we maintain these parentheses in order to maintain the order of operations. So we look up here, we want four divided by five, then we want five X minus four divided by three. So I put five times X minus four in parentheses, divide that by three. Times nine, I mean minus nine times, we put in parentheses, four divided by X plus nine plus X parentheses divided by Y again, this should be basic mathematical order of operations. Um, it's just how you translate this into programming. If you have a complex mathematical equations, you must maintain the order of operations, all right? Or you'll just get a wrong error, a, a wrong result. Your program may not give you an error, but your result will be wrong, all right? So 
So here's another one. Again, we maintain our order of operations. So what I would do is probably put this right here in parentheses divided by three, put all of this in parentheses divided by two times X in parentheses, and so on and so forth. This is actually for you all, but uh, basically, um, like I said, translating this into that order of operations is important if you want to keep your equation correct. Evaluating expressions, hopefully I have the answers to these. So again, in this one, we do the parentheses first, four plus three, then we do our multiplication. So four times four down here, then we do the next multiplication, five times seven down here. Then we do our addition, three plus 16 is 19, 19 plus 35, 54, 54 minus one, 53. Again, basic order of operations. This should be familiar to you if you take um, algebra or you've taken algebra, pre-algebra, any of those courses, the order of operations should look familiar to you. All right. In our multiplication, multiplication again, addition, addition, subtraction, and our final result. All right. There are some shortcuts in Java that we can use. So plus equal, minus equal, times equal, divided by equal, and um, percentage equal. Just FYI, if I don't see your face at any point during class, you will be marked as absent. Just FYI. Thank you, Shaw. So what do these all mean? I can add variables, I can add numbers or other variables to another variable with these shortcuts. And you see that written out in longhand, this is what it equals. So let me show you an example of this. So let's say I have int radius equals five. Int additional number equals 10. Let's say I want to add these two together and set radius equal to that. I can do radius equals the current value of radius plus additional number. Again, in Java, in any program language, it evaluates this part first and then sets the left side equal to it. So we'll get the current value of radius, which is five, add additional number, which is 10, set that equal to radius. So what does that look like? I would expect radius to equal 15. So right now, radius equals five, additional number equals 10. Now radius equals 15 and we finish. Shorthand of this, I can take that out and just do plus equal. It's shorthand and it, does, it accomplishes the same thing. Radius equals 15. What if I want to subtract this? Minus equal. So now radius should equal negative five, which is not a valid radius, but same thing. I can do times equal. Again, it takes the current value of radius, multiplies it times this, and we get 50. We can do divided equals, it doesn't matter. We can do all of those shorthands and it basically just shortens our statement. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. If you don't want to use it, you don't have to use it. You can write it all out, radius times additional number. It doesn't matter. It's just shorthand, shortcuts. All right, so how do we increment and decrement a number? Basically, just add one to it. It's a simple way of adding one. So for example, if I have int count equals zero, right? Let's say I'm counting something and I wanna add one to count each time. I would do count equals count plus one, right? Each time. 
I'll do it again. I can do it again, 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 and again. And each time I'm adding one to count. So if I visualize this, count equals one, now two, three, four, five, right? And I'm just looking over here. I might've went too fast. Over here, count equals one, two, three, four, and five, right? Or okay. we can, oh. go ahead. Um, question: If we, when we use this Java visual, Java visualizer thing, will it be able to show us where the error is, like as we like go line by line by line, if we put in our own code? Yeah. So if I have an error here, so let's say for example I forget a semicolon. Before I can even run it, it tells me I have an error. And it tells me on what line. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. So again, we can have this right here, or we can shorthand this and do plus equal one. So I can replace all of this with plus equal one. Right? We can shorthand it like this. It accomplishes the same thing. One, two, three four, and five, right? Another way of doing this, if we're just incrementing by one, it's an even better way and more elegant way, if you will. Plus, plus, that's it. That adds one to whatever number. Count plus, plus. So it does the same thing. And when I'm doing that, if I have a count or I'm, you know, just wanting to add one to something, I use count plus plus, all right? It's just shorter, you know, programmers are typically lazy. So we try to find the shortest way of writing the same thing. Plus it makes your program more efficient, okay? And efficiency in programming is very important. You know, we get on the internet and we don't expect delay, nor do we like delay. You know, a web page takes a second to load, that's way too long. It needs to take milliseconds. So there could be a couple of different issues. It could be a programmer didn't write an efficient program, so it's taking forever. Could be the internet, it doesn't matter. Or when we use an app. If we're trying to use an app and this joker is taking too long, it's probably a programmer somewhere along the way who wrote some inefficient code. So efficiency is very important in programming. And it's interesting, as you learn more programming, you start to realize all of the technology we use is a program. And they started where you all are right now. They started with basic hello world and worked up from there. And everything we use, I mean, Xbox controllers, PS4 controllers, PS5 controllers, they have little programmer, little programs inside them that tell the computer how to use the different buttons, right? What all the different buttons mean. Um, our cell phones are composed, are co co uh, comprised of hundreds of thousands of little individual programs. Right? The computer you're using right now uses hundreds of thousands of different programs that are all intertwined and build up the full system, right? PowerPoint is a program. So here's just another example of um, the plus plus right, int i equals 10, int new num equals 10 times i plus plus, and I'm basically explaining what the difference is between plus plus when you put it before the variable and after the variable. Pre-increment versus post-increment. So basically, the most important one is plus plus, i plus plus. Um, don't really use the, you know, the plus plus before the variable. It's called a pre-increment. You can, it's used in certain uh, situations. But in this class, you'll mainly be focused on var plus plus or even var minus minus, which subtracts one. So if I do this and I do count minus minus, 
it's going to subtract one from count. Whereas plus plus adds one, right? So the first one, count minus minus, subtracts one. Count plus plus adds one. Minus minus subtracts one. Plus plus adds one. Right? So I'm just going to skip over this. It's not really important, the pre increment versus post increment. All right. This is just some exercises. The post increment and pre increment, it just depends on when that number is changed. Is it changed before the equation or after? So, for example, in this one, I do i times j and then I increment j. So, this is two times three. Whereas in this one, I increment i first, do the equation, then de decrement j. So, I increment i first, i is two, so i would become three. j is currently three, so three times three equals nine. Then after this equation is done, I would decrement j. It all depends. All right, there's another thing called a type conversion. And this whole slide is just, you know, for your information, some of the things that we'll be using throughout this class. So there's something called a type conversion. So what's the difference between using a double and an integer? What's the difference? A double has decimal points, integer does not, right? So if, for example, I'm dividing an integer by a double, the output would be a double, right? Because all integers are doubles, right? But not all doubles are integers, okay? So what I mean is, I can represent any integer as a double. So I have int count, I could just as easily do, sorry, double count. And it does the same thing. I spelled double wrong. I could just as easily do double count as I did integer and the program still works, right? except now each one of these values has a point zero on it. However, let's say I have double count equals, I don't know, 0 0.658, right? And I try to visualize this. Count equals 0.658, decremented by one, incremented by one, decremented by one again, increment by one, increment by one. It still does all the incrementing and decrementing that I expect. However, I can't convert this number to an integer. If I do, I think I might get an error. I might get an error. It's incompatible. Because this has way more precision than the integer provides. Right? This is way more precise than just saying zero, which is what an integer is. So I say all this because if I try to int count, let's say int number one, one equals 15. Int number two equals 14. Int result equals number one, divided by number two, right? When I do this, again, an integer, it does the division and then it chops off everything at the end of that, uh, after the decimal point. So I think this should be a zero, if I'm not mistaken, or one, right? 14 goes into 15 one time, but you know 14 and 15, it doesn't go in a perfect one time there should be other additional numbers after this. But since I'm using an int, I lose that precision. However, if I convert this to a double, I convert this to a double, I retain that precision. Right? So it's important 
to keep those as double, if you know that your result is going to be a decimal point, you want to divide this by a, a double. You want to have a double double somewhere in your equation so that Java knows the result will also be a double. Or else you'll lose that precision. So if I make this an int, I'm going to lose that precision. And actually I get another error because this result would be a double and I'm trying to store it in an integer. So anytime you have a double or integer and you're trying to do multiplication, division, whatever it may be, you want to try to use doubles for those because they're more precise. Integers will chop off everything after the decimal point. Okay. And that's what basically I'm saying here. If one of the operands is double, the other is converted into double. Otherwise, if it's a flow or a long, the last case is if both operands are integers, they maintain integer values. Okay. All right. So then I'm going through examples. If one of the operands is double, the other is converted into a double. So double f equals 5.6 and j equals 4. So the result is a double. f plus j would become a double. j is converted to double. Same thing goes for a float. I know we're not really concerned with floats in this class, but it'll become a float. Longs, we're not really concerned with longs in this class, but if one is a long, they both become longs. And the other is an integer. Now again, if this was a double, the result would become a double as well. Double is the most precise. However, both of them are still integers, the result would be an integer as well. And we're going to do a lab, it's either a lab or assignment that really, you know, shows this point in practice. Another thing you can do is you can cast them. So one is doing this right here, which is kind of what we did. It's implicit casting. Basically, Java is going to convert this to a double. There's also something called ex explicit casting where you tell Java to turn this into a double, right? Or an integer. So up here, if I do um, this right here, and I visualize, it works. Everything works. However, let's say I do this right here. And I have double right here. I'm going to get an error because this result will be a double. However, I can tell Java explicitly to convert this result into an integer and then store it into that. And I will get rid of that error. Right? I explicitly tell Java to make this result an integer and then store it. I don't get an error anymore. So that's just it explicit casting. I can tell Java to make this an integer. Okay. Oh, so you can, it's basically like force override or something like that, even though it wants to be an error. If you put the integer and then those parentheses, it'll like cancel it. Exactly. Kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, I'm basically forcing it to override what it wants to do and making it an integer. Same thing, I can make it a double, it doesn't matter. Yep, so I'm forcing 2.9 into an integer, so the nine gets dropped off or truncated, right? So it just becomes two. So what's wrong with this statement? Basically, this result would be a double, so we would need to explicitly typecast this into an integer in order to store it, all right? So how do we convert between a string and a number? All right, we have strings, which are words, then we have numbers. So if I read something in from the console as a string, I have to convert it into a number in order to use it and vice versa. So in order to explicitly uh, parse or cast it, we have to use these methods, double.parseDouble, and we pass our string. 
Or for an integer, we do integer that parse in, right? That converts a string to a number. So for example, actually let's keep this int number one. String read from console equals 15. Right? That's a string. I can't just put read from console right here, or I'm going to get an error, right? Incompatible types, java.lang.string cannot be converted to an integer. So in order to do so, I do integer.parse int. It parses that string into an integer. However, I must know that this string is a number. If this is A, B, C, D, it's gonna get a parse error. Right, java.lang number format exception for input string A, B, C, D. So I have to know for a fact that whatever I'm trying to parse is a number or I'll get that error. Now, I shouldn't get that error. It's gonna parse it correctly and everything's gonna move on as expected. You would do the same thing for a double, except you would do double dot parse double. All right, and it's going to convert that to a double, or output is still a double. All right, integer, I'm sorry. So now, what if I want to convert this result, right, into a string? So vice versa, string, result string equals, basically all you do is result, concatenate, an empty string. That's it. You just can kind of, whenever in Java you, you uh, add a string to a number, it's going to convert it to a string by default. So result string will now become a string. It has those parentheses, which means that it's a string. So that's how to convert from integer to string, vice versa. Same thing goes for double to string and vice versa. Okay. Just conversions. Again, this whole slide is just FYI information. We'll use it throughout this class, so it's important to know um, as we go along. So the last thing today, I believe, yep, last thing, last three slides, random number generation. How do we generate a random number? So there's two ways. One, you do random ran equals new random, just like this. It's kind of similar to how we did our scanner. Or we do random ran equals new random with a seed value. And that seed is used to generate, it's used within the random generation to uh, make it a little bit more random. Because in, in coding, or not coding, in computing, you can only get but so random, right? Computers cannot generate a truly random number. So it's actually considered pseudo-random, but for programming purposes, it's random enough, all right? We don't have to get much better than that. However, a program cannot, a, yeah, a computer cannot truly get random, right? It's pseudo-random at its core, but it's random enough for our purposes. So in order to use the random number generator, we do random, and then we name it whatever, equals new random. I choose to name it rand. Just like our scanner, we must import that random class, java.util.random. And now, instead of, you know, parsing all this, let me just generate a random number. So how do we do that? We use the next Boolean, which gets us a Boolean value. Uh, I don't think I've explained what Boolean, but Boolean basically is either true or false. True, false, that's Boolean. It's helpful for when you're doing uh, conditional conditions. So if this is true, do this. If this is false, do this. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. But you have that method available. You also have a next double, which gets you a random number between zero and one. And you have next int. 
which gets you a random number between zero and whatever max number you pass. So let's say I want a random number between zero and 15. I'll do rand.next int. And I'll pass in 15 as my maximum number. And now I will get a random number between zero and 15. So the random number, rand is a random number object. Just ignore that for right now. Number one, the random number is actually one. That's not what I wanted. Let's do that again. I want a different number because that makes it confusing. Here we go. Number one is eight. It's a random number, right? Our output is zero, zero, eight divided by 14 would give you zero point whatever, but we're converting this to an integer. So we're getting zero and our result string is zero. I have a question. Go ahead. Why did you put it import Java random instead of um, scanner like before? Because I want to use the random class, right? I'm using random here and not scanner. If I want to use a scanner, I can scanner input equals new scanner system dot in, right? I can have both of these in the same program, but I would still need to import java.util.scanner. And instead, okay. I want, let's read this in from the console actually. So I would do input.next double. So what I'm doing here is the first part is, is generating a random number. The second part reads a number in from the console. This next part does a division and converts that to an integer. And then the last part converts it to a string. Right. In order to input something from the console, I have to use this little box down here. So I'm gonna do two. So it's going to read two from the console. I'm missing my parentheses. All right, so you see I created both of these. I've created a random object or random uh, object and a scanner object called input and rand and input. Now I generate a, of course it generates a zero. All right, let's do this again. It generated zero again. One more time. Hopefully it doesn't generate another zero. I don't want zero. There we go. 13. So now we're going to read in two from the console. Do 13 divided by two. And convert that to an integer, which is six. And then convert that to a string. All right. So again, what I did is I created a random object. So I can generate random numbers. I create a scanner so I can read in from the console. I set number one equal to a random integer between zero and 15. I set number two equal to a number I read in from the console, which was over here. My result, I did number one divided by number two, and I explicitly cast that to an integer. Then the last step was I converted this result into a string and stored it into this variable called result string. All right. So One again, more question. Go ahead. What is a string? A string is just a variable, a variable, a variable type that can hold a word, a sentence, a paragraph. It's used to hold like letters, characters. Um, Again, paragraphs, sentences, words, names, versus an integer and a double are used to hold numbers. Okay, so a string can hold anything. Yeah, it can hold numbers as well. <laughs> okay, so, okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I believe this was just a final thing, but we haven't gotten to what switches are, but I basically used a random number generator to generate a random number right here, but 
that's not very important right now. All right, well, that's it for today. I will see you next time if there's no more questions. All right. Again, the lab and the assignment will reinforce everything we've talked about today. So those will help if you're still confused. However, if those don't help, again, let me know. I don't want you all to get lost. If it doesn't make sense, I'm here to make it make sense. So let me know. All right. Bye, Professor. Take it easy. Another one.